Well, we are in a series about relationships. And last week, we spoke about women submit to men. Actually, we talked about the man's responsibility. And today, we're going to talk about women submitting again. Aren't you excited about that? Yeah. Yeah. I read an article a little while ago basically saying that that is abusive and that meant that is an archaic thing and it should never happen and it's, it's dangerous to society. We need to get rid of that. Have you noticed today things have changed in our culture? There is a, please understand everybody, what I'm about ready to share with you is biblical. It's not political. Is that clear? We're not, we're about being biblical here. I don't care about God's not right or left. He's up. I'm on the right wing. I'm going this way, man. So what, 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 what's the deal with all this? Well, we spoke last week about it. We're going to talk about it again today. But we see there's disorder in our culture today. God made everything. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, he created them both man and female, and it was good. It was like, oh, shoot, I made a mistake. They should all be the same. There's a move today to make men boys and men girls. There's a move today to make women, girls, and boys. It's crazy. God created them both male and female and called it was good. It is a demonic attack upon our culture. The people are being subverted to it. And and incidentally, you tell a lie long enough, you begin to believe it. We have a responsibility to stand for truth. And we believe the word of God, the Bible, is the final authority. The 66 books of the Bible at this church, we believe it's the Word of God. And I will preach the Word of God, not to be angry at other people about it, but I'm going to preach the Word of God. I don't care what they do to me. I will preach the Word of God, and you need to live by the Word of God. We live by the Word, and we die by the Word. So, with that being said, I, you know, the Bible is saying, I will be bold, and, and I will be, you're never going to see me more bold than when I preach the Word of God. I'm never this bold. I'm bold when I preach the word of God because it's true. And to my dear friend who's in the cloud of witnesses in heaven, Jim Castle, who told me, he said, yeah, you're funny, you're good, but you know when the power comes, Eric? It's when you speak the word. And so I will always, thankfully for him, I always make sure that every sermon is infused with scripture in context. So, with all that being said, what is the story about relationships? A lot of people here, today, last week we spoke about the man's responsibility, and some of you guys had fun with that. Today we're going to talk about the woman's responsibility. Women, you are to submit. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Now, this is crazy. You, what, are you going to bring out, are you going to get out Kool-Aid and drink? No, we're not going to do that. Though the ushers did rock the doors. But a lot of people, when you say women submit, this is what they think. Wives, submit to your own husbands. <laughs> There's a lot of sports going on right now. You can sit on the couch all day long like Jabba the Hutt. Anyhow, but a lot of people think that's what it is. It's abusive. And has there been abusive women in the past? Oh, my gosh, yes. Absolutely. So women, wives, submit to your own husbands. We talked about that last. What does this actually mean? It doesn't mean that, by the way. It doesn't mean that. What does it actually mean? We're going to get into it today. And so what I try to do is I recognize this is a very sensitive topic. And I was very careful to make sure that I was uh, careful. So I've asked my wife, I've asked my wife, Sandra, to look through my notes to make sure that if anything's objectionable that might be hurtful to women, that I'll take it out of the sermon. So as a result, in conclusion... <laughs> It's been great having you here today. Thanks for coming to Cornerstone Church. (laughs) By the way, there she is. Let me just say something to, to you today. There's no other person in the world I love more than my wife, Sandra. I love her more than I ever have. I do. And The reason I'm up here is because she's here. Because if she wasn't here, I would not be here. She makes me better. She's amazing. She is. And she knows I need a strong woman. And she's a strong woman. She's not a, she's not, okay, what do you want, honey? No, no, she's tough. (laughs) 
She grew up in Colombia, okay? She's tough. She's Hispanic. She's got fire in many ways. Okay, let's leave it at that. But seriously, there is an interplay that happens between her and I that I am better as a result of her. And I respect her so much, and I, I'm so gracious to have her in my life. And so we're going to be talking about I'm glad you're there to keep me in, in line, okay? But anyhow, so this is what uh, we mentioned last week. Wives, submit to your own... By the way, what does it say there? Yeah. Women, you don't have to listen to a bunch of guys. Hello, your own husbands. But I'm not even married yet. Well, if you're not married yet... You know people that are married? Okay? So we, we need to help get things in order. It, why, there's so much disorder because there's... This is... Okay, you might want to write this one down. This is really profound. There's so much disorder because there's... Ready? Disorder. So today we're going to put things in their proper order as Scripture talks about. All right? And so we got to be a people of the Word. No more of this, I, you know, that this, this has been moves right now. A dear pa- I'm not going to mention the guy's name. A pastor that I had great respect for has been kind of going like this further and further from the Scripture. And finally he came out and saying things that are anti-God, and I can no longer support the guy. He's a heretic. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Andy Stanley's a heretic. Wasn't going to say it, but I'm going to say it. He's, he's, left, he's left the boat, man. And uh, we love him. I pray he comes back. But his, 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 his whole definition of sexual, sexuality is off the boat. And, he's, and, and I'm gonna, I didn't mean to say it, but I just did. I'm glad I did because we have to say it. If I'm off base like that, call me a heretic. Please do. But anyhow, that's beside the point. Now you're going to look. No, don't Google it right now. <laughs> but all this gender blender stuff's going on. God made man and female, and it was good. Why are we trying to make the night day and the day night? Let it be what it is. God made everything beautiful in this time. Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the what? Head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. We mentioned last week that men were supposed to die for our wives. We're supposed to lay down our lives for our wives. Jesus left all of heaven and came down to become one of us. He didn't think about himself. He thought about us. He sacrificed himself for the bride, the church. Husbands, we ought to do the same. It wasn't about it's submission, not subjugation. That becomes less than. What does all that mean? Well, I like what Ann Atkins says in one of her books. Before we can hope to be good husbands or wives, we must learn to be good Christians. We must all become self-sacrificial and submissive, all of us. We have to sit and listen, everybody. We make it real simple here at Cornerstone Church. Believe that Jesus exists, give your life to him, and then we spend the rest of our lives submitting to God's purpose, design, and relationship. I'm going to submit myself to God. The moment I submit myself to God, I have peace, strength, and solidarity. The moment I submit to my own ideas, I get insecure, angry, and frustrated. So, we're talking about this, spirit and power. Last week was this, part one, the role of a husband and Christ in the church. Today is part two, the role of the wife and Christ in the church. Notice it's spirit and power relationships. That the context of this passage is built upon being filled with the Holy Spirit. The only way you and I can truly be in a good relationship with each other, ultimately, is we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit that brings us into a place where we can supernaturally deal. Listen, I'm a very selfish guy. And I have to constantly, and by the way, every time I die, I feel better. What is that supposed to mean? Well, the Bible says I crucify my flesh daily. And when I die, I truly am alive. And so we talked about this on Friday that you know, every time the dead comes back up, it's called a zombie. And zombies terrorize your town. And zombies will terrorize your life. When you're giving your life to Christ and you start doing your own thing, the zombies come back. You got to get the spirit shuttle, shovel, knock them over the head and bury them again. The old way wants to come back, but God's way is the only way and it brings lasting peace and my friends, it works. All right, so submission applied. Submission is personal for all of us. Submission is a part of life. Let me go ahead and remind everybody. The Bible says in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, for you are all what? Look at your neighbor, say you're a son. 
Said you're a son of God. Make that very clear. You're a son of God. What does that mean? All your sons. So the Bible is basically saying there's no male, there's no female. Yes, it's saying that in one way. We are all of the same value to God. Men and women have the same value. Men are not better than women. Women are not better than men, though I would beg to differ. But anyhow, I'm not God. But you are all sons of God in Christ. So there's no gender. Well, hang on. Through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many as you were baptized, you gave your life to Christ, into Christ you have put on Christ. You, you tracking with me, everybody? Okay, so we're all sons. Now, what does that mean, we're all sons? Well, one of the things you have to understand about Hebrew culture and the culture of the older days is that the sons got the inheritance. The sons got uh, what the father had. Women had little rights in the Greco-Roman world. In fact, a Roman could sell his wife into slavery. Talk about subjection. Hey, honey, I don't like the way you're doing things. I'm going to sell you. I'm going to call up somebody. And a wife had no power. They were uneducated most of the time. And so you could sell your wife at any moment to slavery. In fact, when you had a daughter in the Greco Roman world, she wouldn't even have her own name. So if my name was, <coughs> my name was Eric, they called my daughter Erica. If my name was Julius, her name would be Julia, or the first, or the second. They, they wouldn't even call my name. They could not vote. They were not included in the census. I mean, they were just property. That was the Roman Greco world. And in the Jewish world, it was a whole lot better, as we mentioned last week. It was a whole lot better. God gave dignity to men and women. But Jesus, by far, is the greatest women's liberator that ever was or ever shall be. The last person at the cross was a woman. The first person at the tomb when he rose again was a woman. The first female evangelist effectively was a woman. In the early church, women prophesied. Women had ministries with their husbands. So you can see it was, it was scandalous. And, 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 for, and for the apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to say this was absolutely a finger in the eye. This was scandalous. Now we're not done yet. Okay, this is verse 26. Now 27, here's 28. There is neither Jew or Greek. There is neither slave or free. Now, 40% of the population in that day were slaves. And they were subhuman as well, and so were Gentiles. If you were a Jewish person, a Gentile was a dirty Gentile. So, there is neither Jew or Greek. There is neither slave or free. There is neither male or female. We're all androgynous. We're all asexuals. No, that's not what it says. What we're talking about here is value. We all have the same. There is neither male nor female. You are all what? One. one in Christ. We are one. We have the same value, but we have different functions. That's important to realize. If you want to build a car and the whole car is an engine, how far is that engine going to get? You need many parts to make the whole. And we all work together submitted to the master and the creator of all things, God Almighty. So the Bible, this is, this is unbelievably offensive in that day. We're all one in Christ, but we have different functions, but we all have the same value. And one's not better than the other. That's why, listen, I may be preaching up here and all that, but people who serve and give you donuts and smile, you're going to remember that donut and that smile before you remember me next week. All of you are important. If you're a janitor or a stay-at-home dad or mom, if you're, if you're a janitor, then janitor the floor to the best of your life and be the best you can be. God's not going to judge you. Be anyone else but yourself. So I better treat you with value. And here's the thing I've learned a number of years ago that I love to repeat. This, this is a little footnote into the side of what we're talking about. But there's a couple of things, I, three things I want you to remember about all people. Okay, first one is this. Everyone's made in the image of God. So you must show respect to God's creation. It's very clear. Even in the book, book of Jude talks about that. Show respect to God's creation, number one. Number two, 
everybody is going through a battle you know nothing about. People are facing stuff or have faced battles you know nothing about. And number three, you can learn something from everybody. Somebody is better than you. Everybody is better than you in at least one thing, and you can learn from. When you have that mentality, it helps you. Helps you see people a lot different. So we are all one in Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to go back now a little bit and just kind of rehash what we talked about because it's important, all right? We'll go through it quickly. All relationships originate from God's relationship with himself, okay? You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, okay? The Trinity, God the Son, the Spirit, the Trinity. They have mutual submission. Go back to week one. I described as the Trinity the best way I can, okay? They're all, they're all equal, but they have different purposes within it, okay? We have submission is the key to all relationships, and God was fine by himself. I know some of the songs we sing, he thought of me, he loves me, he can't live without, no, he can live without you just fine. <laughs> God's not listening to, I'm all out of love, I'm so lost without you, I knew you were right. No, he's not singing that sappy song by Air Supply, okay? God's fine without you. The reason you're around is because he loves, he has a love relationship, and you're here because he loves, and he expands, and he's creative. He doesn't need you. I'm sorry to break the half the worship songs. Submission is the key to all relations. We have to submit, and submission is part of the original relationship. Before there was, God always was, and he is always in this mutual submission together, and this is how it looks like, sort of. Okay, you have the Father, you have the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Remember, everybody, I'm trying to describe a realm that we don't even have here. Because this is the best we can do, okay? Father, Son, they're all God, but they all have one. And he, God's, a, God's a deciding factor. He's the nucleus. He's the controlling, he's the basically, he's the, basically the one that makes the final decision. But the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right? So you have God, the Father's not God alone. The Son's not God alone. The Holy Spirit's not, they're all three in one. But the Father is the one that the Son and the Holy Spirit submit to. And so in many ways, this is what's supposed to be in a marriage. We mutually submit to each other, but God does give leadership, generally speaking, to the man, actually, in the design. You see, design reveals the destiny. I'm going to take you back for a few moments on the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis in chapter 1. Well, I would love to do a whole sermon series on Genesis. I'm praying about it. It's going to be an amazing book to go through. But in the very beginning, he said he made them male and female. And then in chapter 2, it, it particularizes. It gets down to the nitty-gritty. God created man and female, male and female. So this is what happened. The last of God's creation was man. The Bible says that God created man out of the dust. And then he placed him in the garden. Adam was created outside the garden. He did not come from the garden. He was God's caretaker for the garden. Okay, now what did Adam do in the garden? He's the first of creation, first of humanity. In the Hebrew mindset, and in the early days, the firstborn of society, firstborn of your children, responsibility is to take care of the rest of the family. They get double the inheritance because they're supposed to take care of everyone else. That's why the Jewish people I have no problem. They're the first. And you know what? They have, special, they have special things that I don't necessarily, and even though we're equal to each other, they're the ones that introduced the Jewish people through Abraham, through David, and all. The, Jesus came from, uh, from the Jewish line. So they're the firstborn. And that's why we should pray that our older brother comes back to the Lord. But the firstborn has greater rights than the rest. This is the way it is. Okay? Now, that's the first thing. So Adam was created outside the garden, okay? Then he came into the garden, and what was his job? To take dominion and rulership of that garden. He named the animals, which in the Hebrew mindset means you're giving identity to it. Men, we have an obligation to tell our children who they are in Christ. Tell your daughter, you're a beautiful young lady. Tell your son, you're, you're, you're a handsome and strong man. 
Tell them what they are before society confuses the snot out of them. Tell them who they are. So, so, design, so that's what happened. Now, after he created man, man named all the animals. We talked about this. Platypus, hippopotamus, right? And by the end of the day, blackbird, <laughs> bluebird. So he named all the animals, right? Then God caused a great sleep to come upon Adam. He took something out of Adam. Adam lost something. He took woman out of the side of him, not to be trampled on by him or above him, but someone alongside of him to be co-heirs with him. Now, Eve was created where? In the garden. Adam was created outside the garden. So that's why the Bible says, prepare your fields, then build your house. Men, young men, we need to grow up, get a job, prepare your house, and take care and prepare a place for a woman to come into your life as your wife. You're supposed to be the leader and the provider and the protector. That's sexist. No, it's design. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but when Luke came home, I was not nursing him. I try. I just don't have it. Sandra nursed him. Okay? Women receive. Men initiate. Why is that controversial? Women are nurturers by nature. Hello. Emotionally, they are as well. Generally speaking, they are. Why is this controversial? It's design, right? What's all this metrosexual stuff? Men, be men. Be a man. Be a man. Stand up. Don't be passive. Protect those that are being abused. Serve. Open the door for the lady. Give them your seat. Care about the less fortunate in society. Boy, pastor, you're really stepping on it. No, I'm not. This is, what, this is our design. Women have, I can't, as much as I try to, the Bible says, there's things I don't understand the book of Proverbs. A woman with a child. I, I, I can't, be, listen to me, everybody. It's a good thing, guys and ladies, it's a good thing men can't get pregnant. There would be no one left on the planet. There ain't no way I'm going to have a child. I get nervous when I have gas. <laughs> Women can handle pain much more than men. If I get, if I get a little cold, I'm calling for the mortuary. I'm going like, to oh, arrange my funeral. My wife's like, she's going around. She's like, how are you doing? She's sick. She's, she doesn't care. Right? Anyhow, design reveals destiny. Back in the older days, it was a hunter and gatherer type of societies and agriculture society. It wasn't until the Industrial Revolution where now men went to the factory and left the women at home. They used to work very closely together at home. So now the women stayed at home and the men went to work. And then this is the our society in the 1950s. We changed it. I grew up where my mother stayed home and the men went to work. And the vast majority of the women stayed home with the kids. Right? And, uh, and all that. But I'm not going to tell all that right now, but th things have changed obviously now, and that the, the technology has le lowered the fields. And we don't, we're, not, we're not an agricultural society anymore. We're more of an informational society instead. So things have changed. But don't try to go back to the farming area. Do you see that, everybody? This is something you've got to pray and decide with your wife and you. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But what I will tell you is God made them male and female. Oh, I'm running out of time. And He called them good. Is that, does that make sense? Okay? So women, okay, we're, we're going to move forward here. Go on quickly here. Okay? And this, the whole passage is based upon this. And do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another. The whole passage is, you need to be filled with the Spirit. The only way, my friends, you're going to run a good life and a good marriage is be filled with the Spirit. Now, with all that being said, we get to the bottom of this, giving thanks and submitting to one another in the fear of God, because everyone's made in the image of God. Then we get to the next verse. So, submission is personal. 
Submission is practical. The Bible says in Romans uh, 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. We're called to be subject to our government. We're called to pray for those over us. And yes, God put Joe Biden in the White House. God put Donald Trump in the White House. God put Obama in the White House, uh, President Obama in the White House. Okay? We're to be under their authority until they ask us to do something that's not correct. Then we just go like this. With all due respect, I must obey, obey God rather than man. That's why I will preach the gospel, whether it's legal or illegal. It doesn't make a difference. I'm not going to be a jerk about it, though. Does it make sense? Okay? So let every soul be subject for no authority except from God. That's right. God put Nebuchadnezzar in charge. He put Pharaoh in charge. And it's appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority basically resists God. So we're a very rebellious society today. Don't you tell me what to do. Right? We rebel against the police. We rebel against authority. Some of you rebelled in the way here to church this morning. Went too fast. But we won't talk about that because that's where I live. All right. Obey those who rule, and this, by the way, this is for the church. God gives authority in the church as well. I'm not throwing myself around. Listen, I'm just, I'm here. I believe God sent me here. My job is to help to be a spiritual leader for you all. I'm not better than you, but this is my position. Okay? Obey those, this is about pastors and spiritual leaders. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch for your souls as those who must give an account. I'm going to have to give an account what I preach or what I don't preach. As those who must give an account, let them do so with joy and not with grief. So that would not be, that would be unprofitable for you. So we have submission is personal, it's, a, it's practical, and it's purposeful. What does that mean? Well, but I want you to know that the head of every man is what? Christ. The head of the woman is? That's sexist. No, it's design. And the head of Christ is God. There's order in everything. When you, okay, you're going to write this down, everybody. When you're out of order, you have? Thank you. You guys are so smart. Okay, back to Ephesians. Submitting to one another. Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord, for the husband is the head, the top, leadership of the, he's the tiebreaker in the home. I'm, unless, okay, we'll get into a few moments. Okay, hang on, everybody, before you, I can't believe, oh, hang on. The head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let their, wi let, let their wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, let me qualify this. You take that verse out of its context. If your husband is asking you to get drunk and go to parties and do drugs, uh, you don't have to submit to that. If your husband asking you to falsify records and to be illegal activity and sell all kinds of narcotics and get involved with all kinds of crazy stuff, you do not have to follow that because he's not in Christ. And so with all due respect, I am not going to submit myself to that. If your husband is beating you up, let us know. We'll take a posse of guys and take care of them. by calling the police, because I don't want to go in prison. <laughs> I'll just got to be honest with you, everybody. I'm not stupid, okay? You, no one should have abuse. If he's verbally abusing you, if verbally abusing is not saying, honey, I don't like the way the dinner is. That's not being abusive. I'm talking about verbally abusing. You don't need to stand underneath that either. Step out of that. Let us know. We'll help you through it. Pastor Randy will tell, help you. I'll hand it over to you, hey, Pastor Randy. I don't know where he is, but... There you are, Pastor Randy. He's gonna, if you don't like anything about this message, go to Pastor Randy. <laughs> so let them be subject to their own husbands in everything. So if he stands out of line. So we must obey God rather than man. Listen, everybody. In the book of Jude, it talks about, um, talks about the, the dispute over Moses' body. Michael, the archangel, did not make accusations against Satan, but said, be gone, Satan. So he even showed respect to the devil. When I hear people say, I'm going to kick the devil in the teeth, you're an idiot for saying that. That's stupid. That's a lack of respect. How could I just say that? I just said it. I'm sorry. But no, I'm not actually sorry. We need to show, <laughs> I just contradicted myself. I called you an idiot. <laughs> you're acting like an idiot if you do that. Does that make sense, everybody? We show respect to God's creation, okay? So let the wives uh, be subject to their own husbands in everything, okay? So this is what has to, in everything. So what submission is not? We just talked about it. If he's verbally abusing you, 
if he's misusing, what happens if your husband takes the paycheck and goes to the, goes to the casino? And you can't, listen, that's not right either. So you have a respect. He's stepping out of his born, out of his, so do, with all respect, you need to curb that. If he's not willing to curb it, then you need to find a way to curb it and help him to make the right choices. My wife puts me in line. Seriously, I thank God for my wife. She says, I hope she'll tell me some things that have happened wrong in this service, so the next service I'll get it right. But, you know, so you know, that's what happens. So what you need to do, wives, you need to submit to your husbands, but if they're out of line, you have a responsibility because, by the way, the word submission, and I forgot to mention this, the word submission in the passage is in the middle voice. You know what the middle voice is? It's voluntary. The wives voluntarily submit. When it says, children, obey your parents, that's not voluntary. She's a co-equal with him. You understand? I, that's, that's a big point I should have mentioned initially. Do you get that, everybody? Okay? So, wives, likewise, be subject to your own husbands, that even some who do not obey the word, that without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. I had a woman call me. Uh, my husband won't let me tithe. What am I supposed to do? Your husband, well, I think you need to listen to your husband. But the Bible says to tithe. I understand that. But maybe what he gives you or something like that, the money that you're responsible for, you have a right to do what you want with that. But I'm not going to tell you to defy your husband. Do you see how it works? And look what happens here in the Bible. It talks about wives, how they're supposed to work with their husbands. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even to some who do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. You're such a heathen. Don't call your husband in heathen. Sometimes the best thing to do is not ask him to go to church anymore. Stop asking. I, I, guys, can we, how, many, how many would agree with me that, uh, how many believe the N word works really well in a marriage? The nagging. Okay, okay, it doesn't work. All right. Wives submit to your own husbands is fitting in the Lord. The husband love your wives as, uh, and do not be bitter towards them. And we need to, Wrap this up, everybody. Submissive here between love and respect. Let me explain this about this. Nevertheless, let each of, of you, in particular, love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay, there's some fundamental needs here. Part of love is respect. But men have fundamental needs. Women have fundamental needs. Just get a bunch of kids together. The boys are throwing rocks and throwing dolls across the, across the room, generally, and the women are making little houses. Generally speaking, that's so sexist. No, it's called design. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm actually getting frustrated with, with this. This is so horrible that I have to even talk about this. Is it be, it be, if you would have told me 20 years ago that I'd be talking about this, I would say it's a joke. I can't believe what's happening. Okay? So... Nevertheless, let each of you in your particular love his wife as own self and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Um, so what, is that, what does that mean? Let me explain. Let me explain what that means. We'll show it here as well. You have parent, adult, and child. A man's fundamental need is to have respect. Respect. It, you go to the street. Why did you hit him back? Why did you shoot the guy? He didn't show me. Men desire Respect. We really don't care too much about, oh, I think, listen, I like Hallmark at the waste of money, okay? I don't care, I don't, I don't care about a card. I don't care about cards. You can buy me all the cards you want. That means nothing. But when my wife shows me respect, I feel better about myself, right? When I show her love, honey, I'm thinking of you, and you're the best thing that ever happened to me, and I send her flowers and all that, she responds to it. I don't give a rip about flowers. I don't. But when she shows me respect. Now, I've been to some places where I hear men tear their wives apart, and put, oh, my wife's such an idiot. Or I've seen wives say, oh, my husband's so stupid. He can't do anything right. I've been at parties in the church, not recently, where a, husband, where a wife was berating her husband right in front of everyone else. That will castrate a man emotionally towards you. Men need respect. Women need love. Men, when you love your wives, you treat her with respect and love her, you know what happens? She wants to respect you more. When you, when you feel respected, you want to love her more. There's a whole book about this called Love and Respect. It's an excellent book. But it's true. Fundamental need. The Bible tells men to love their wives and it tells them when to respect their, their husbands. So imagine this, if you will. This is called a pack. Parent, adult, child. 
This is the man, this is the woman. What happens often in a marriage is this. Sometimes the, 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 the husband will talk to the wife like she's a child, or the wife will talk to the husband like he's a child. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's, that's debilitating, that's, that's insulting to us. What we're supposed to do is be parent to parent. No, not even that. Because you know what's going to happen eventually? The kids are going to leave. They won't stop asking for money, but they will leave. <laughs> Let's give the order here, everybody. God first. Then come, if you're married, then your wife, not your kids. Not your kids. Wives, your husband's important. Don't neglect your husband because of the kids. The kids have to fit it to where you live. Adam and Eve came first, then came the kids. I'm telling you, everybody, it's out of order to live for you. You don't live for your kids. You live for God. You, you and your, the best thing you can do, the best thing you can do, the best thing you can do for your children is to love your spouse, period. I've got a couple right here in the middle. They have seven of them. And they've done a great job with that. And we're so, we're so blessed to have them here and they're helping us with our, our marriage ministry. That's what it's called to do. You can love each other. So it's God, husband and wife, then the kids. So having a relationship parent to parent, when the carriage lives, there's nothing left. So what really what we want to be able to do in a marriage, in this pack, if you will, is to do it this way. Adult to adult. That you are co-laborers in the field of your home. You are to work together. Mutually, women, you are voluntarily submitted to your husband. There's a difference. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. If you don't want to give, don't give. God loves a cheerful giver. Does that make sense, everybody? I need to wrap this thing up because the next service is going to be coming in a few moments. So not quite in a few moments. But let's close with this. But above all these things, put on agape, which is the bond of perfection. Let's pray. Father, in the matchless name of Jesus, Lord, I recognize what I'm saying today, unfortunately, is controversial when it does not need to be. Lord, I pray if anything I've said that is not right, I stand to be corrected. But Lord, I believe I've represented your word with, with dignity and respect. And Father, I thank you for the gift of love. I thank you, Jesus, that you are the example of what we are to be. Father, I pray for every man in this room, whether they're married, single, divorced, widowed. Lord, I pray for every man to be, to be encouraged that he could stand up as a man, not to be passive but to be the protector. To be the one that lays down his life for others. One who protects. So Father, I pray a blessing on the men right now, Lord God. In this culture which is emasculating us as men, I pray that we rise up in this place as warriors who serve, who love, who lay down their lives who do not demand their own way, but serve as you did Jesus. And Father, I pray for women in this place as well, single, married, widow, divorced. Lord, I thank you that every woman is made in your image as well. Lord, we pray that husbands and wives would work together. Father, I pray that the men would be like you, God the Father, working together, Lord God. So Father, I pray that you'd help the wives that are married to men that are passive, men that are perhaps weak, Lord, we ask you to encourage them, that you'd bless them, Father. And Lord, I know it's, it's virtually impossible for me within 35 minutes to solve all the woes of marriage between men and women. I recognize, Holy Spirit, there's a lot more needs to be done. And I ask that you would do your work. Yes. Father, show us how we can help encourage each other in Jesus' name. Bless marriages. Bless men. Bless women. Lord, I pray right now for those that are confused about their gender identity. Lord, let them know that you did not make a mistake when you made them a male or female. Father, let them know they're fearfully, wonderfully made. And you said it is good. When you met a woman, you said it was good. And when you met a man, you said it was good. Father, we pray for those that maybe have medical conditions, psychological issues, or maybe there's a biological issue as well. Lord, we thank you that you're a God of compassion, grace, and hope. We pray for healing for those as well. But Father, we pray that we'd stand up and that we'd protect those who are being abused including indoctrination that destroys children. Father, let us stand up with truth, hope, and power 
and be the salt and light you call us to become in our culture. And Father, we thank you that your way is true. Your way is right. And we submit our lives to you today.